Welcome back to the Fade Forward Podcast. Again, this is two weeks in a row we've restarted, but that's just fun for me. Yeah, we just uh, the, <laughs> the consistent <laughs> listeners, the consistent right. viewers, we just want to let them in a little bit behind the scenes. That's right. Because what they would have heard in the non-recorded last opening was, uh-huh. is we don't really know when they're watching this. Nope. So they could be watching this a year later, two years later, yep. or hearing it. And they're like, this makes no sense to me because hopefully by a year or two years from now, we've figured this part out. But yep. right now we're at the beginning. These are like James Cameron Easter eggs in his movies. It's going to be good times. Um, so yeah, we're in week three in this series on prayer, both mm-hmm. on Sunday mornings and here on the platform. Week one, we were talking about the reality that prayer is a two-way conversation, not a series of one-way appeals and requests, which then led us to week two, which is the reality that if prayer is a two-way conversation, we need to make sure that we know who's on the other end of the phone. That's right. Because there's actually a few options available as Mm -hmm. to who might be talking back to us. This week in week three, we're coming back to our side of the conversation yeah. and not so much talking about what to pray or what words to use, but what's the condition of our heart mm-hmm. when we pray? Why are we praying? So talk to us a little bit about the message on Sunday that's going to lead us into the practical application. Well, where we ended the message on Sunday was when Jesus gave the disciples a model. He taught them how to pray. And it says, you know, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We just focused on that part. But before he got to the model about how to pray, he first wanted to focus on the heart. And in fact, a lot of Matthew chapter 6 in that section about the Sermon on the Mount really focuses not necessarily on on what you're doing, but the heart behind what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so in understanding prayer, what Jesus teaches us is, number one, this reinforcement of relationship, Mm -hmm. because he very, very clearly, clearly in verse eight of Matthew chapter six says, listen, God our Father knows what we need before we ask him. It's like, so this idea of coming to him to inform God and a transaction or whatever need we think about it doesn't need to be so. Come to him in relationship. And so when we come to him in relationship, the first thing is we need to come with sincere hearts. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it again uh, on platform like I talked about it on Sunday, is that there's a difference between coming to God with a desire and coming to God with an agenda. Mm -hmm. I think we all have desires, but agenda is where a problem comes in. So where's our sincerity in that relationship with God? But then also the next thing is, Will we submit to God in this? Because he models for us this idea to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, which there's an inference there that there are other kingdoms and that there are other wills. Yeah. And lots of times our prayers are really when they lack the depth of sincerity and the heart towards God that he's calling us to have, that conversation with him, our prayers could often be good prayers, but it's more like my kingdom come. Mm-hmm. And by good... I'm just saying this, that there's a lot of valuable things that we want to see happen in our own lives or other lives, whatever it might be. And so we don't look at them at front and go, oh, well, this is a horrible prayer because I'm asking for this bad thing to happen or this bad thing to happen. Right. So good prayer, because wouldn't it be great if blank, 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 and blank, and you fill in your own blanks, happen. But just because it's our will doesn't mean it's God's will. Mm-hmm. And just because it's our kingdom doesn't mean it's going to move his kingdom forward. And so the second aspect that we focused on was submission. Mm -hmm. And so the heart around our conversation with God, when we know it's God, is that are we sincere in what we're coming? And are we willing to submit our will to his? Because I think there's the rub. I think all of us, I don't think, I know. Anyone who's prayed to God has had this tension moment where we don't understand why he's answering the way he's answering, Mm -hmm. why his timing is the way his his timing is. And so many, that is, that's the question. That's where I discover this. Do I really believe that, that God's character is worthy of my trust when his answers don't come in the time frame or in the way that I expect? Do I really believe that God is sovereign when my will, the good things that I want seem to be better than maybe what I am experiencing at the time yeah. from God. Will I trust him in that? And so if I had to ask, actually ask, add one thing, I kind of called this uh, talk, I called it, <laughs> I just went blank there for a second. It's funny, I'm just, uh, this happens if you've been on the podcast before, whenever I have to give a list, I always, <laughs> always, always have a problem. Well, anyway, you talk about the idea of what is our idea towards our heart? Are we going to be sincere towards God? And then we're going to submit. And then if we submit, it requires trust. That would have been the third word I would have said. So there you go. And so as we always do on the Faith Forward podcast, the goal is to be practical. 
practical application. How do we how do we start to do this? And it's not always focused on the doing. Oftentimes it's on our awareness of mm-hmm. how we're doing it or why we're doing it. Which, which is a good is clarification, especially for this week. Right. Um, because if we go back to some of our previous episodes, we've talked about the significance of the heart, the importance of the heart um, in this relationship with God. We've talked about how Proverbs says to guard your heart above all else, for from it flow streams of life, streams mm-hmm. of living water. And the reality that I mean, there's just, there's so many times that Jesus talks about the importance of the heart. He talks about the importance of your internal world when he's talking to the Pharisees. And on the outside, you look like white, you know, you look good, but you are whitewashed tombs. You're good on the outside, but inside you're just, you're dead. Mm. Right. And through the Old Testament prophets, God frequently says things like, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And so there's just, there's this, this recognition that we need to have that what we're doing is not always being informed by a heart that's in agreement with what we're doing or how we're thinking about it. And so when it comes to our side of the conversation and prayer, it's really helpful to pause and take stock of what's going on in us beneath the surface. And so in the message on Sunday, you laid out a couple of these helpful contrasts mm. that that prayer is about, you know, not the agenda, yeah, but about desire, mm-hmm. right? That, that it's about a heart level posture of surrender, um, but not necessarily a heartless, whatever you want, God, I don't hear, cause you're gonna do it anyway, right there. And so we wanted to spend some time allowing some of these heart level beliefs to surface. Um, you had talked even in the first couple of weeks that some of the things that hinder our prayer relationship with God, our conversational relationship with God is the way that at a heart level we view God. Yeah, and if you didn't catch me talking about this on Sunday or didn't catch our podcast, I just talked about personally, and I I don't think I'm alone, is that a lot of times that we have an aspect of God, and we have it very clear, but it's the only aspect of God we have clear, so it does limit it. So Scripture is clear. God is king. He's Mm -hmm. sovereign. He's powerful. He spoke the world into existence, and we need to relate to him in that way. But Scripture also says that he's our friend. And for me personally, if I'm going to say that I struggle in one area more than the other, because I've not arrived even in the God is the King area for yeah. sure, but I would say it's the friend. Mm-hmm. And so how do I relationally connect to my friend? And so even last week, I used the illustration that a lot of us connect with God much in the way that we collect with celebrities. Sure. Even if you don't think of him as King, like we just kind of think they're out of reach. And we mm-hmm. have a whole lot of things we would like to converse about. Yeah. It's not that we don't have a whole, we do, we have a whole lot of things we want to converse about. It's just that we don't mm-hmm. for one reason or another. Maybe we think we bother him. Maybe we think he doesn't have time. Or I think lots of times we hear something at a head level, but don't receive it at a heart level. And so I think when we hear that God wants to have a conversation with us, that he is our friend, but we don't receive it at a heart level, we just kind of like, oh yeah, that they're supposed mm-hmm. to say that. Yeah. Then we don't engage him. Not quite the same, but in some ways the same. So I recognize that lots of times people engage me through a very particular lens. And that is the title that comes before my name, Mm -hmm. pastor, right? So what I discover is, is that there are some people that when I have lunch with them or I connect with them or whatever, and I'll I'll follow up and go, hey, I really love this. Hey, let's get together again. And then I'll say this, I'm saying this not because I have to. Mm -hmm. not because it's required by my job description as a pastor to say, I enjoyed our conversation and let's get together again. I usually joke and say, I'm just too old for that anymore. I don't even buy into that. But what's really interesting is, is I've noticed there are, there are varying reactions. The two most common was, huh? And that, no, no, actually this is not going to be something that's going to be relatable just in this one way but that there's other ways to relate, Brian not as pastor, Brian as friend. Mm -hmm. But then there are others who they've never said this, but I'm fairly sure they received it at the head level, but not at the heart level. Mm -hmm. Because I'll say something like that, and their first sort of response is, oh, I don't want to bother you. I know you're busy. It just bounces right off. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not insincere on their part. And in fact, here's the great thing. Almost every time that I I can't recall a time it wasn't this way, there might have been. They say that back out of respect. Sure. They say it back out of kindness, but it's still missing a depth of relationship. Mm-hmm. And we do it the same with the God of the universe. Yeah. And, and trust me, he's way more interesting to talk to, way more wise, way more beneficial to have as a friend than I am, for sure. 
And he offers that, but that's where I think the rub is lots of times. We know something in our head, we hear something in our head, but it hasn't made the heart level. And yeah. that's why we don't approach him. And so we like, oh, you know, they seem a little bit, he seems more accessible, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It also, it reminds me of the other place in Proverbs talking about the heart as a man thinks in his heart. So is he, mm -hmm. and I would add on to that as a man thinks in his heart. So he relates and as a man thinks in his heart, so he prays. Yeah. And that's part of what we want to get to today is we've, we've got a few more, um, you know, contrasting comparisons that will hopefully raise some of these heart level issues to the surface of our awareness where we can start to see them and go, yeah, that resonates. Mm -hmm. That's, that's me. I, I don't think I realized it, but I do that. Yeah. And awareness is the beginning of transformation. Awareness is not transformation itself, mm -hmm. um, but it's the beginning, right? We, we have to bring things to the surface because that's really where God prefers to deal with them. God doesn't like to woo stuff away under the surface much as we want him to because he's a relational God and he wants us to know him as he is. He wants to know, he wants us to know what he's doing mm -hmm. in our life because it draws us closer to him. So he allows these things to come to the surface and then helps us to deal with them yeah. so that we see him doing it. We know that he's good. We know that he's trustworthy. We know we get to come even closer. So we've got a few of them here and maybe we'll just rattle off the whole list and then come back and tackle them. Oh, I think one that's at an excellent time. idea. Do we have podcast notes? I've never even asked about that. <sighs> we don't. Maybe if, this, if we ever develop podcast notes, I yeah. think this would be a good one for there, this table. So yeah. note to ourselves, if we ever go back and listen to this <laughs> podcast to see if we can do better, make sure you put the notes in the podcast. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so, so here's the quick list. It's a half dozen. Um, but prayer is about sincerity, not obligation and ritual. Prayer is about relational connection, not just appeasement or transaction. Mm. Prayer is about being transformed, not primarily getting what you want. Prayer is about the expansion of God's kingdom, not primarily about the expansion of my kingdom. Prayer is about becoming someone, not just about achieving something. And prayer is about, a prayer is about heartfelt submission, not heartless obedience. Mm -hmm. So which one of those you want to tackle first? Well, I forgot to mention something up front that I mentioned on Sunday that if I remember correctly from my classes, that it's a form of reasoning that you could say, and I said this, why we pray influences how we pray yep. and how we pray actually reveals the type of relationship we have with God. Mm -hmm. So if you're unsure about the type of relationship you have with God, I think it's called inductive reasoning. Start at the end and move inward. How do you typically pray? That is a revealing statement to how you view God. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I deeply struggle with is a sense of obligation behind prayer. And another word could be used for me, maybe not for you, but for me, guilt. Mm -hmm. So uh, I grew up in a particular church background that well-intentionally motivated by guilt. Don't do this or this bad thing's going to happen. Don't do this or this bad thing's going to happen. Don't do this. And, and that's not Jesus. That's not how he works. Mm -hmm. I do believe they were well-intentioned, and I do believe they were, they were trying to follow Jesus. But there was just, all of us are not perfect in, in lots mm -hmm. of areas. This was an area of struggle. And, but being a person who already struggles in certain areas like perfectionism yeah. or control or wanting approval from checking a box, guilt motivation works really, really well when I don't understand that's mm -hmm. guilt motivation. So now I've discovered that when I feel like someone is trying to guilt motivate me, I got to go back and pray because then I got to deal with anger because I feel manipulated <laughs> right. for a different time and a different talk. Yeah. But it's amazing when it comes to prayer about how easily I get into the moment where I am going to pray, but it's not convenient. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop and it's not convenient. I'm going to do something and make everything else problematic. And by the way, there's not a thing wrong with that. And there are times we should do it. The difference is, is how I think about that moment. So if I don't do this, here's a time, I don't stop and talk. I don't stop and do this. It's really, really easy for me to think things are going to go bad. Mm -hmm. It's really, really easy for me to think that somehow if I don't do this in this moment, that then God is not going to blank. And it's mm -hmm. by definition then transactional. Yeah. But that's really what obligation versus sincerity is because 
when I think about it, though, it, it never really comes into my mind that I can think of like, I want this, so I'm going to do this. I'm much more wired. I better do this or this bad thing won't happen. And mm-hmm. so one of the things that we've talked about this podcast uh, before, for many of us, we don't really understand the depth of which how we're loved by God. And so what that means is, is we try to perform for that love. I'm mm-hmm. guilty of that. And so how it shows up in prayer about a relationship is it's this obligation ritual. I better perform and do this because I know it's in my best interest or that. Mm-hmm. When instead of like, hey, this is this is awesome. I, I just I get to do this. Yeah. And it's that heart level thing because John, I'm not even sure sometimes that I'm aware that I'm doing it in the mm-hmm. moment. And there are times where I've been aware later on, looking back. Thank goodness for the grace of Jesus. Right? He knew my heart when I came, but he accepted me the way mm-hmm. I came. And then there's some times where um, I could come in and I want to talk to God. And it's this version of, hey, all right, it, it, it's, let's just talk about something else. It, it's yeah. Just spend time with me. Yeah. The first time that I actually felt like God said, you know what? Well, you don't have to say anything. Just, just be here with me. Mm-hmm. It really kind of took me off a little bit because I thought, oh, I don't have to do anything does this count? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and it does because in a real relationship it counts. Yeah. But it was showing the way. So that that's yeah. the first one um, in that way. But also went a little bit into that relational appeasement transaction aspect. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. There's one we were talking just before we hit record, um, and you reminded me of a story that I've told on here a few times about my experience with God during last year's Lenten season mm-hmm. and um, you know fasting of my morning, yeah. um, you know, giving the first of my morning to God. And, and I've shared about day 36 and how transformational that was. But as you were just talking, it reminded me of the first day. Mm. And I don't think I've shared that story yet. Um, and as I've shared here before, you know, a lot of my communication with God is, is in the area of words and phrases. Um, I, I love words. I love books. I love long sentences. Um, and God knows me and he's wired me that way. And that's a lot of our conversation. Um, but we all get to grow in the ways that God communicates and mm-hmm. we all get to experience more. And so during that particular time with God last year, um, the very first day, rather than words, I got this picture that came to mind of me and God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit sitting around a campfire and, you know, like four points on a compass. And it was really disorienting because nobody was saying anything. And so I sat down and I joined them around this campfire and nobody's saying anything in this picture in my head. And I I wanted to ask a bunch of questions, like, you know, with the celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's all these things that I want to ask, but it was one of those times where like the, the the sense that I had was like, read the room. This isn't what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. We're just being together. Yeah. This isn't about getting anything done. This isn't about direction for the day. This isn't about a time of confession and repentance. This isn't about a time of, of anything. We're just hanging out. Mm-hmm. And it was an incredibly, wonderfully disruptive moment to begin what was an incredibly, wonderfully disruptive 40 days of reorientation of a lot of these heart level things that I hadn't realized about myself, that I was primarily coming to God out of a sense of obligation, I am supposed to do this. I'm supposed to have a quiet time. I know all the good things that come from having a quiet time. I know what happens if I stop having regular times with God. Mm -hmm. And so even though I know it's good, I'm doing it because I have to, like brushing my teeth. Mm -hmm. And I know the ways that have worked better and I know the ways that haven't. And so I'm choosing to do the things that work better and I'm choosing to do it regularly, like brushing my teeth. And I wasn't even aware of the reality that I'm spending time with God the way that I spend time brushing my teeth. And so that very first day of those 40 days where God just so wonderfully disrupted my normal. And it's not that speaking was forbidden. It's not that, it's not that he didn't want to talk to me. It was just, we're doing it a new way. I'm teaching you more about me and I'm showing you more about you in the process that these pieces are in there and let's allow them to surface. Let's bring them up to the level of your awareness so that you realize, huh, this is the way that I've been interacting with God. I don't think I want to interact with God that way, but I couldn't make that conscious choice until until I became aware of the unconscious behaviors. I couldn't make it more relational in my intention until I realized that what I was doing was essentially transactional. Mm-hmm. 
right? If I don't show up today, something bad's probably going to happen. If I don't show up today, I'm probably not going to get the things that I would have. If I don't show up today, God's probably going to be a little disappointed in me relative to how he would have felt if I had, right? There's all these things that have an element of truth in them, but were being twisted to make the relationship with God something so much less than relational. So I was listening to you tell that story. It struck me, first off, the power of the story, but also what was happening, if I'm understanding it correctly, that God was forming you, yeah. turning you into someone. And it made me process that, because this is, this is me in, in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. And we, we've talked about this off podcast. I don't think we've talked about here is that the way in general God and I's two-way connection works is different than yours. Mm-hmm. Not evaluatively better or worse, just different. And so if you were listening to John talk about this moment where he f- sat down, there was a picture in his head and those sort of things, and you had something inside of you that began to think something like this, oh, well, I better sit down and pray and I better do this because I haven't arrived at that place. Yeah. That's a setup for misunderstanding of what prayer is because then it's about achieving someone mm-hmm. or achieving something instead of becoming someone yeah. because God knows exactly the best way to connect with us all the time. It doesn't mean he exclusively does it in that way. So, for example, we've talked about this before. Uh, my wife is is a lot like John in regards to um, when she's communicating with God. Pictures, mm-hmm. a lot of pictures. And we'll pray about something, my wife and I together, and she will uh, a lot more times than I ever do have this picture, this great sort of moment. Mm-hmm. And she and I've shared this in teaching a class that we both did before. And I'll ask her, like, well, what did God talk to you about? And she'll share this great, you know, picture, and it's usually got colors in it and all this great stuff. And she'll go, what did he say to you? And I'll be like, he said yes. And there's a balance in that. Mm-hmm. If all I ever heard was yes, no, maybe, come back, you know, short, that wouldn't be a relationship. God is magic eight ball. Right. That wouldn't be around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. However, God also knows uniquely mm-hmm. how I work. And so the truth is sometimes, and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Have you ever talked to a person that is worthy of talking to, but they talk to you in such a way that tires you and exhausts you? And the answer to that is yes. If the God of the universe knows who I am because he made me, he understands when it's the right time to do the right thing Mm -hmm. if I'm willing to be submissive. Because I know this for a fact that sometimes I hear about all the things that that my wife sees and that sort of stuff. And I think to myself, I think that would overwhelm me. I think it, and it might, my point isn't get real specific on, should I have more pictures or should I not, or should I hear specifically? It's how am I engaging this? And do I trust God in that moment to help me become the someone he's already made me to be? Or do I begin to look at John's walk or do I begin to look at someone else's walk? And then without even trying to, create a model that may not be applicable to me. Mm -hmm. I think I also want to just take a moment that we're going and looking at our our own self. I also want to just want us to be careful looking at other people and taking the way that God works with them and uses them and without even trying, developing an evaluative judgment that says they are not at a place they should be Mm -hmm. or they are at a place that we're not and wish we were there. Yep. It, it's unique in that way. And then when those things happen, my point is, is that it becomes really then easy to turn prayer into a transaction. Yep. I'm doing this because I want to be this person, yep. but God is the person who knows the best person we're supposed to be. Yeah. And so it was just, it was just striking me there. Cause the other thing I think what happens there is this would be an example. If we approach God in that way of wanting to expand my kingdom, sure, I, I but not his kingdom. Because I don't, th- there's not a thing wrong, I think, with saying, I want to see a picture or I want, I'm, yeah. those are great things. Yeah. But if I begin to think that is the definition of this moment, yeah. that's an example of something that's good 
and right and holy, but putting my desires and my will before of God's in his time. Yeah. And I feel like I'm, I'm a little wordy with all of this and often to the weeds, but this is how the heart works. Mm-hmm. I found myself, and I don't know if you have as well, I found myself many times thinking I'm in a good place, mm-hmm. doing the right thing, and then later on, like you just mentioned, God's revealing, hey, not quite yeah. um, where we are in that. So, yeah. Well, because like we said, I mean, the goal is being transformed, not just getting what you want. And so like you were just pointing out, if the goal is for me to become like another person in my mm-hmm. relationship yeah. with God, that's more about getting what I want or what I think I'm supposed to want. Or Even what, if the other person's a really good person. Yeah. Right. But the goal is to be transformed. And so again, we always have to remember that there's a, a third active party in this relationship with us and God, and it's the enemy. Mm -hmm. And the enemy doesn't care which way we fall off. He just wants us to fall off. And so if he can get us to fall off on the side of false comparison, where my relationship with God isn't good enough unless it looks like this other person's relationship with Mm -hmm. God, fantastic. He's got you right where he wants you. Mm -hmm. But if he can get us to fall off on the other side of, I'm not going to compare my relationship to God with anybody else. I'm not going to learn from what anybody else is doing. My relationship with God is mine and my alone. And I don't have to do anything any other way that anybody else. That's dumb. That's dumb because there's a reason that God told us to be in relationship with him in community with others because we are supposed to learn from how he's relating to others. I think what I would say is those people around us are there to show us God, not to become our God. Exactly. And and that's really easy to then make them the focus and how they are or how they're not instead of the part of God that he's trying to reflect uh, right. to us, right? Right. It's Hebrews 12. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, mm-hmm. both above and on this earth around us, but we're supposed to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, mm-hmm. the author and perfecter of our faith, to run with endurance the race that's set before us. And And so it's the both and, right? You're supposed to be encouraged by the people around you. You're supposed to be inspired by the people around you. You're supposed to be instructed by the people around you, which is why we gather together on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to fix your eyes on Jesus and do the next thing that he's inviting you into. Yep. And so you get to have the expansion of your understanding. I mean, that's what we try to do on this platform, right? Is expand the categories in which we then go and personally invite God into. Mm -hmm so that we're always aware of the reality that there is more without ever falling victim to the trap that unless you are constantly becoming like other people, you're not really growing. And that's where it brings us back to that idea of this is about the expansion of God's kingdom, both on this creation and in his creation, and not just you becoming who you think you're supposed to be or somebody else thinks you're supposed to be. So if we didn't put this on the podcast notes and we forgot, here's what they were. Prayers about sincerity, not obligation and ritual. Relational connection, not appeasement or transaction. Being transformed, not getting what you want. The expansion of God's kingdom, not the expansion of our kingdom or my kingdom. Becoming someone, not achieving something. And heartfelt submission, not heartless obedience. And here's something I'd like to invite you to uh, as, as we go to the next part. Maybe you've had some insight, and we always love to hear from you about what God's saying to you, or about some things that we can come back to you and talk more about one way or the other. Maybe God's giving some insight here. You want to let us know. I'm, I'm always up for learning. I know John is for two. You can uh, send it to us faithforward at cfcwire.org. But, um, John, another thing we said is how we pray reveals the type of relationships we have with God. Yeah, so I, I think it's really about the cultivation of this relationship. Mm. Right? That, that's okay. what we've been saying this whole time yeah. is that prayer is about the cultivation of relationship. It's not primarily about obligation or ritual like you just listed. It's not appeasement and transaction. It's not getting what you want. It's not the expansion of my kingdom. And it's not even about achieving something, which I think for me was one of the really valuable lessons of the last several years of my life is I really, I don't think I ever realized how work focused I was. Mm. I don't think I ever realized the extent to which I felt like I need to be accomplishing things. I don't think I ever realized the extent to which in my relationship with God, I felt like God's primarily interested in doing things, not knowing me or letting me get to know him. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've used the phrase before. It felt like it was a whole lot of God. What am I supposed to do and where am I supposed to go? And it's not that he doesn't care about that. He does, and the scriptures are rife with examples of God calling people to do things and to go places, but never to the exclusion of the cultivation of that relationship. And so it, it brings me back to the reality that prayer is about becoming someone. 
both the transformation of me into who he meant me to be, but also the transformation of me into someone who knows him as he is. Mm -hmm. And that's really what prayer is about. Prayer is about the cultivation of relationship and becoming the kind of person. I heard um, one guy that I I really uh, appreciate the way that he talks about things sometimes. Uh, he's written a couple of books on some things like this, and he said God is, is constantly looking for people that he can entrust with more of his kingdom. And mm-hmm. so, you know, was saying, become the kind of person. And that's where it starts. Become the kind of person in whom God can entrust more of his kingdom. Yeah. It wasn't do more for the kingdom so that you become a good person. It was become the kind of person in whom God can entrust more of his kingdom. And I have needed that to surface from a heart level up again and again and again to realize I am so often convinced that what God wants to do in me and through me is something rather than turn me into the someone that he sees when he looks at me. So reflecting on that, you just shared that, do you find that if you look back pre that understanding, not assuming you've always arrived now, but pre that understanding that the way that you pray changes. Like yeah. what, the types of prayers before would go and say, all right, what's the task? Which is not a bad thing mm-hmm. to say, but that was it. It yeah. wasn't like if the task seemed like I just want to sit here and do nothing, that didn't seem acceptable. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I bring that up because that's for me too, that I, if the only way I can even think of that is okay is if God said, okay, Brian, this is a task. I'm like, okay, let me reorient. This is a task, but no, but this is a joy. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't think about, all right, I've got to sit at the beach next to my wife and I'm going to check this off the checkbox of things Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do. I think to myself, I get to sit at the beach next to my wife. And I don't think about all the other things that, that aren't happening. Um, how would you describe, I guess, and this is maybe a little bit off book, but in you, mm-hmm. how that looks different yeah. for people like me mm-hmm. who often would not even know how to put words to the difference. Yeah. So our journey is is just that. It's a journey, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's process over time. It's change over time. And so as I now have the benefit of some hindsight, looking back on the ways that God has guided this relationship— you know, you talked about the need for submission. One of the first things that I had to be willing to submit to was, okay, God, we're going to do the things you want to do, not the things I want to do. And that was a really necessary shift in our relationship. And so there was a lot of good that came from me starting my days with, all right, God, what do you want to do today? Because Mm -hmm. I was learning submission. I was learning to surrender my will and recognize that not all the things that I wanted to do were necessary. Not all the things that I thought were a good idea were a good idea. Mm-hmm. And, and so there was a way of learning surrender and submission to his will and his kingdom that I needed. There was a book that I read several years ago um, by St. Teresa of Avila. It's called The Interior Castle. Mm-hmm. And she talks about the reality of our interior being as being comprised of you know, she calls it seven mansions or seven houses and that our spiritual journey is the progression from one to the next. And she made this at the time comment that just blew my mind, um, which was essentially that what gets you here won't get you there. And I found that to be so helpful in my life with God that often what we want to do is turn God into a process, Mm -hmm. like we've talked about before. And so if I get really good at surrendering my actions, at surrendering my to-do list to God, I can take that into the ditch of God only ever wants to talk to me about what to do and where to go. And we could have an incredibly productive series of conversations about what to do and where to go, but never make the the turn, never make the correction back to it's not only it's not only about what to do and where to go. Yeah. And so it brings me back to the what got me here won't get me there. I had to learn submission and what to do. 
in order to grow familiar with a God who wanted to talk to me about more than just what to do. Yeah. And so then had to learn to let him disrupt my to do with talking to me about who I'm becoming. And that's where I've found so much transformation in this next part of, of my journey is, I mean, even driving into work today, turned off the radio in the car, as you and I have talked about, we do more often than not now just to make space available for the conversation. And I was, I was cracking myself up at, all right, God, what do you want to do today? And it was like, still, still, this is, this is where I find myself more often. And it's mm-hmm. not a bad question, but it's my heart level posture of assuming God wants to start with what to do. It, it's revealing because if we talk about this this way, like to the God of the universe, we're all, it seems a little abstract, I think, for some people. But if you just, you replace the God of the universe who loves us, who's our king, who's our savior, mm-hmm. Jesus is, who's our friend, with the person that you call the closest mm-hmm. person on this planet yep. that you care, and put their person and say, okay, now how would you feel about that if that was always the first thing? Yeah. You know, okay, all right, now I get it, now I get it. And so, yeah. you know, maybe a real practical thing for you is if you're thinking about, well, how do I apply this and take my faith forward is the way that you're engaging prayer, the conversation with the God of the universe, if that was the only way or always the same mm-hmm. way. And there, don't get me wrong, there's some rhythms. I mean, if you happen to be married and you get up at the same time and you're moving around in the morning, I, there's some, I imagine if it's like my family, there's some pretty common things that we go every morning. But if that's the only thing that I said, yep. if that was always this, you know, um, then it was that's not growing that relationship. So yeah. if if maybe you're struggling with this because I'm going to say personally, I would have struggled with this at some point, not in the long past at all, simply because sometimes for me, abstractly, and God is in no way, shape, or form abstract, but sometimes abstractly, I need, like, give me an illustration. Give me mm-hmm. this personally. Help me. I do that with my with my wife, Kathy, all the time. She'll say, hey, I feel this way because I feel you did blank. And I'm like, hey, I, I acknowledge that feeling. I recognize it's real. Hopefully I say that. Uh, I'm not denying it. But could you give me an example? Mm-hmm. And so some of you may be wired and saying, hey, I need to figure out this next step to get to where... God might want me to go to transform me to becoming the someone he wants. I need a little bit of help. And so I just really encourage you to maybe take your faith forward as examine how you talk to the God of the universe and say, okay, take the person you care the most about Mm -hmm. on this side of eternity and place them there and say, what's good about that way and the consistent and what would not be helpful. What is not as good. Yeah. And there's so many things that, that may come up as you start to do that analysis. And again, it's, it's not to critique. Mm Mm-hmm. It's it's not to beat yourself down that you're doing it wrong. It's all invitational. It's the recognition that there is still more available that you get to experience on this side of eternity for as many more days as we each have left. There's more that we get to experience. This isn't just drudgery until Jesus calls us home. And, and so you may recognize that you're constantly having the to-do list conversation with God that you would never have with your spouse. Yeah. Um, it could even be the way that you refer to God in prayer mm-hmm. that, you know, He's the God of the universe and he's all powerful and he's sovereign. He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But if we only ever talk to him that way, even though he's told us that we're friends, Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you feel if every time I saw you, I referred to you as Pastor Bales or Dr. Reverend Pastor Bales? I would laugh because I know you had an agenda, but I would not feel like your friend. Right. Well, and I think is those examples, I mentioned it last week. You don't even necessarily think about that. Just the way I mentioned that Kathy and I agree we don't have significant deep conversation after 10 o'clock. And then I realized, okay, if the specific time I'm always carving out, and it wasn't I wasn't having conversation Mm -hmm. with God in other times of the day, I was. But if I was waiting to think the one time I'm going to carve out is after 10 o'clock, well, that doesn't make any sense because I wouldn't even do that with my wife. And so there's some of these things that I think just need to get really practical in. And when we're able to get really practical in that way and look at it that way, I think we're getting closer to understand that God is our friend yeah. right? just as much as God is King of the Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. And I loved your illustration about how you uh, refer to God. You can hear a lot about how you think about God and how someone prays. 
And if that doesn't work for you, whenever you read scripture and you hear God talking, Mm -hmm. you have a voice for God in your head. We all do. That's, that's why reading is such an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. If you've ever watched a movie and thought they weren't nearly as good as the characters in my head, it's because you created them yet and you create them from something. I want you to know this, that when you read scripture and you hear the voice of God in your head, there's a good chance you're creating it from an understanding and a perspective and a belief about God, knowing or unknowing. So when you read God's voice and it's always the God of judgment, Mm -hmm. That's an indication of how you first engage him. And by the way, he is a God of judgment. Sure. He is holy, holy, holy. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about that. But he's not only holy. Yep. And so that may be just another real practical way to help you. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many more things we could say on this topic, but just increasing that self-awareness, having that third-person perspective on yourself as you spend yeah. time with God is just, it's so beneficial to just be aware of how am I engaging mm-hmm. with the God of the universe and then recognizing all the ways that the God of the universe invites you to engage with him. You know, you see the people in revelation that fall down on their face and, you know, just praise and worship God for his incredible, magnificent, awesome power and presence. Yep. And you see the God of the universe make himself come to earth in human form as a baby who can't control his bodily functions to be that close to people. Mm -hmm. And the grown up version of that baby telling his followers, I call you my friends, right? That, that this, that we are in a relationship with a complex God, not complicated, but an incredibly complex God, the God of the universe who wants to be known. The God who is unlike any other God that mankind had ever heard of who tried to keep himself distant from mankind. This one came to us. Mm. Emmanueled with us, as Mike Cain says, right? Yeah, it's a good word. And so that's that's the invitation is to recognize our is our prayer relationship allowing God to Emmanuel with us, to be with us, or is our, our, is our side of the conversation holding him at arm's length, sometimes out of what feels like honest reverence and respect. No, 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 God, don't come close. I'm not worthy. He says, I know, but that's not the point, mm-hmm. right? Is it that we don't want to trouble him? No, 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 God, you're too busy. And he says, I know, but that's not the point. Is it that we feel like we're supposed to take care of our end? Is it that we're supposed to clean up our side of the street? And he, de- and he says, that's not the point, right? It, it's, do some soul searching. Um, <laughs> record yourself praying and watch it back. That'll be super uncomfortable, but maybe incredibly informative. Um, we get the uh, we get that built into our jobs. <laughs> we get to watch ourselves pray and talk about God and go back and watch it. But um, again, none of this is condemning. None of this is shaming. Mm-hmm. You weren't supposed to have already figured this out. This is just the invitation to take the next step in your journey with God and see what he has in store for you. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if you're listening to this and you are 18 nope. or if you're listening to this and you're 72, right? There's, there's again, this temptation the enemy to say, well, you should be farther along, okay? Let's let that go. Yep. Um, God wants to engage you right where you are right now today and wants to be in this process of developing heartfelt relationship uh, with you at the level that he designed it to be. So, so try it. Ask God. We almost made it to the end. It didn't say that. So, <laughs> so we have close. to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as always, you mentioned it about halfway through, but we'll say it again at the end. If you have questions, comments, um, would like to sit down and talk to somebody at length, share some of your story, hear more of ours. Uh, just shoot us an email at faithforward at cfcwire.org. Mm-hmm. I think we're up to a grand total of 12 emails over the history of this platform. So hey, we would love to go. see that increase. Yeah. Honestly, you would not be bothering us. You would not be taking up our time. It's things that we love to do, honestly. So until we get to see each other in person, he's Brian, I'm John, and thank you for being part of the Faith Forward podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for reeling me in. My apologies. 